Hello, everybody, and welcome to Today in Rivard Sports. Brian McCallum here with Mike Cherry from Florida Today. We're at Cocoa Beach High School today, where the Minutemen are preparing for a district game on this weekend with Space Coast. We've had some district games already, but we're going to talk about some other teams with district openers this week. We're also going to talk about fencing, our sports setter, Lee Nessel. Fencing in the past, took it up again. We'll show you that video in a second. We have an interesting story about the Florida Tech men's soccer team. They're trying some pool training to improve their play. We'll see how that's working out for that team. And of course, Peter Carasota's Florida Today columnist will be with us. He's going to give us some insight on, high, on college football in the state of Florida and how that's going for both the Canes and the Gators and everybody else. Mike, district games. These guys right behind us, Cocoa Beach and Minutemen, are going to play Space Coast this week. Coco has a loss to Atlantic, which is a new district team, a new district opponent for them this year. Space Coast is uh, starting slowly, so they're going to be fired up too. Is this one of those early season must-win games, do you think? Well, I think both teams need a win. If so, must in terms of maybe not even district play, just both, this, both these teams combined are, are one and five. It sounds, like they, it sounds like they both need to kind of get uh, their seasons going, sort of, uh, you know, if they want to anywhere approach what, what they did last year. Both teams won seven games last year. Um, Cocoa Beach didn't go to playoffs. Space Coast did for the first time in their school's history. So I think, in terms of importance, it, it's very important for both for both teams just to try to get back on a winning track. Because other than that, you get to the point where now the seasons could, could really start slipping away if you start if you lose this game. I was a little bit impressed with Space Coast defense in the opener against Titusville. Held them to 14, held Melbourne to 15. Whereas Cocoa Beach has the uh, four-headed monster on offense, which actually has been three-headed lately. We got some. Good news for the Minutemen today about that. Well, yeah, um, Sean. Sean Sims is, is uh, potentially back playing. He's been he's been injured all year, and it was the thousand yard back last year as a sophomore. He kind of came in late last year and was sort of a surprise for him. And this year they really haven't had him healthy, and that, and that's been a killer for them because I think they feel like he's they've been unable to punch in you know in the red zone a few times and and that type of thing. And Cocoa Beach's problem, you know, even in their loss last week to Atlantic, they scored three points. Um, you know, for, for Space Coast, too, I think they, they need to, to get going on offense. Their defense has been good. You know, they held Melbourne to 15 points. They only gave up 14 against Titusville. Led at halftime of both those games, but haven't been able to put enough points together to to really, to, you know, seriously uh, threaten them to win. And, I, and, and both these teams, like I said, I'm sure after last year, this has been so far a disappointing year. Well, you mentioned uh, in the first game, or the first show, I believe, this year that at the high school level, quarterback and your premier running back are the two most important people and that's two of Space Coast's more important losses. Obviously Sean Sims would have been for Cocoa Beach which they lost uh, until this week. Another district game O'Galley is going to be at home against Merritt Island. A team that doesn't necessarily need a win but I'm sure would love to have another one. Mm -hmm. The Mustangs. I've seen Merritt Island. Uh, I know you've seen Cameron Lewis several times in his career. That's kind of an interesting matchup, the, the fantastic athlete Cameron Lewis against that big Merritt Island defense. What do you see in that game? Yeah, I kind of see that being a Merritt Island game because I think they're a ball control team. They grind out against a team that's lacking one, a little bit of depth and lacking size. And I would think that, that unless uh, Merritt Island just doesn't show up or is very careless, uh, that's going to be one, their type of game where they kind of grind it out. It may take a while to get going, but I could see them winning by two or three touchdowns that game. I just don't know if Lewis can make enough plays or if they have enough other people to, that can make enough plays against Merritt Island to really hurt them and, and, uh, and kind of break their confidence. Well, if you, even if you're not able to go to a game on you know, Friday night, you can always go to floridatoday.com and find a million things to look at. We'll have a live stream game. I'll be at that Merritt Island O'Galley game blogging live from the game. If you want to follow that game but can't get there, you can go to floridatoday.com and follow along in the blog. I'll be there watching Cameron Lewis. We just mentioned Cameron Lewis. Dynamic player, always a candidate to be in what we're going to look at next, the plays of the week. Let's see what the top five plays of the week this past week were and who you voted to be the winner. Vieira struck first when Tyler Corns connected with Terry and Hassel for a 39-yard touchdown. The Hawks had one play and scored one touchdown. The 
Hawks would get the ball back, but a batted pass ended up in the hands of Nick Shomish, who rolled 60 yards for a touchdown. nine-yard field goal attempt. Bell's kick was good with less than five seconds remaining, and Coco won 15 to 14. In the second quarter, Keels would score again, this time on a 73-yard touchdown run. In the second half, O'Galley answered when Cameron Lewis slipped through the trenches and scored the Commodores' lone touchdown, a 64-yard run. Well, how about a little sword play from this next story? Our sports editor, Lee Nessel, who has tried fencing before, had her old equipment. She found out about Ironworks fencing in Vieira, she went out to give it a try. Kids fencing, adults fencing, a couple local clubs in town have it. Take a look at this. Well, on average night, I have between six to eight students uh, in a class. And I've been teaching here since uh, April of uh, last year. I have always loved fencing, but for some reason never realized that we had it in the area. It wasn't very well known. And when I found out about it about two years ago that PCC had a Fencing 101 class, I decided to sign up for it. I just love it. Uh, it helps. It's a great exercise. It, it's like, they call it physical chess. It, it has a lot of strategy. You remember the right away goes to the person that makes the attack first. People probably ever since they've had swords have had some sort of fencing to practice and now it's become a sport and it's a very fast sport. It's growing in popularity since the Olympics this last year. The women's sailor team was swept in for second third place. Mike, be sure to stay away from Lee in the office. She could be armed. She could stab you at any moment. If you're interested in that, you might want to check out the Bankati Challenge, Saturday and Sunday at BCC Coco at 9 a.m. You can also check it out online, www.nightblades.com. Well, let's switch topics entirely. Let's go out to the beach. Let's check with Bob Freeman and see what he has predicted for this week's surf report. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, well, here we go, another weekend with uh, some fun surf on the horizon. Uh, here's what I see going on. Saturday, the surf will start off uh, kind of small in the thigh-high range, maybe some waist-high sets. Uh, and will improve slightly throughout the day. Uh, this will be an east-driven swell with a little breeze out of the northeast that will increase and make it a little bumpy later on in the day. Sunday though will be the day we have a solid northeast ground swell coming in. That's the uh, first northeast ground swell of our fall season. We're all very excited about that. The winds will probably shift around out of the southwest. Sunday looks like a real fun day. I'm expecting it to be begin in the waist to stomach high range, increasing to chest to head high range by the end of the day. Not sure how long the southwest breeze will last in the morning, but with a uh, morning low tide, it looks like uh, definitely the morning time would be the best time to get out there. If you can't make it out in the morning, don't worry about it because there's going to be plenty of good ground swell filling in uh, throughout the day on Sunday. So Saturday, thigh to waist high. Sunday, waist high building to chest to head high. Get out there, have some fun. This is Bob Freeman for Florida Today. Well, we're out here at Cocoa Beach High School today. The Minutemen are practicing, practicing behind us. I was at Satellite yesterday for a swim meet. It was unbelievably hot, much nicer today. But on those hot days, you might want to get in the pool. Let's check out something that's going on at Florida Tech. The men's soccer team is trying some innovative pool training that they're trying to help their program with. I'm showing them the benefits of cross-training in a gravity-free environment. Everything in water is perceived in actuality, it comes to fruition, that it's four times harder than on land. And yet there's no 
body interaction in a negative way. There's no gravity to fight the articular stresses or anything. They get the full benefit aerobic, neuromuscular, without any of the pounding on the body. It's a, a very good, important thing to do to add to a training regimen. For us, it's, it's a good opportunity for us to get some physical conditioning done. Um, with giving a little bit of a break to the joints. And um, you know, sometimes, especially after a hard game, it's tough to get that real positive energy. And we've found that with Ed and getting in the pool, even after a hard, a hard game or a hard training session, we can really get a lot accomplished from a physical standpoint, but also from a teamship standpoint, which is some of the value which you might not realize. Yes, come on. You pledge an allegiance to yourself. I can do this. Well, when we're on the field, we're constantly like, pounding our legs. And um, it's great to get in the pool because you're still moving, your heart's still pumping, but you're not pounding on the ground the whole time. So you're kind of getting the benefits without the, the negatives. So it's all, it's all good. An athlete is an athlete. You can see the way he controls his body movement, his musculature, his determination to meet any a challenge. They do what I ask them to do, and they do it repeatedly. So they, have, they understand the goals. They have the desire to improve. And that's the, the substance. That's what makes the character of every athlete worth his weight. Well, that's Ed Nessel, Lee Nessel's dad. She's a swimmer. He taught her, and uh, Rutgers University football team actually uses that training and still does. Well, speaking of being cool in the pool, somebody else who's cool is Peter Carasotis, Florida Today columnist. He's back in the studio. He's going to talk about college football, Gators, Knowles, etc. Hi, this is Peter Carasotis. Welcome to another edition of My Take on Your Sports. A lot going on in college football. We're going to focus on the big three, Florida, Florida State, and Miami. And we're going to talk first about the University of Florida. We know that Tennessee uh, beat them last Saturday, 13-23. I kid, but it did seem like a loss for the Gators, and certainly for a lot of Gator fans. I, I mentioned in my column that uh, coming out of that stadium last Saturday, it seemed like uh, the glummest group of Gator fans I'd ever seen after a win. Of course, they won that game 23-13, to 13. and on my drive home, uh, I saw some fans at a rest area, was talking to them, you know, just kind of like as if I hadn't been at the game and playing dumb a little bit, which I'm pretty good at doing. And, not too happy with the win. In fact, one fan I was talking to uh, lost $500. Uh, no doubt uh, he, he uh, thought Florida was going to win by that point spread, which was uh, 30 points. So there's a, a little bit of concern in Gator Nation right now, and rightfully so. Uh, this was supposed to be a rebuilding year for Tennessee. Uh, a lot of bad blood going into this game. And, of course, those Florida fans wanted blood, and what they got instead was sweat. That game was a lot closer that I think they felt comfortable with. Uh, I know Urban Meyer afterwards sort of downplayed that fact. But um, it's going to be interesting to see how the Gators rebound Saturday against Kentucky, up at Kentucky. I think they'll rebound strong. I think they were stung a little bit by the fact that they didn't beat down uh, Tennessee uh, by, you know, by a substantial margin, which they were hoping to do. Uh, some of the other things that are going to be of concern for the Gators is next year going into Knoxville, I think Monty Kiffin kind of got their attention. The former Tampa Bay Bucks defensive coordinator, uh, you know, held Tebow to without a touchdown pass the first time in 30 games that Tim Tebow did not have a touchdown pass. Uh, and of course, uh, Tebow also had two turnovers that led to 10 Tennessee points. So um, it's going to be interesting next year up in Knoxville as well. Uh, let's move on now to Florida State. And I've been telling people that I that I really think Florida State is on the way back. I think Bobby Bowden's got a good coaching staff in place there. I think that uh, Jimbo Fisher is starting to prove himself a little bit now. Uh, I had some concerns about Jimbo Fisher, you know, when they hired him in 2007, made him the head coach in waiting, uh, guaranteed him all kinds of money if Bobby Bowden doesn't step down by, uh, you know, pre allotted time. But he's starting to show some things offensively, and particularly last Saturday against top 10 BYU, those 54 points were the most on a BYU home field, uh, second most actually since uh, 2003 when Colorado State scored 58 points against them. Uh, they were moving the ball up and down. And let's not forget that against Miami, even though Florida State lost, they were moving the ball up and down the field against Miami as well. And it's a young team. They only have uh, three seniors uh, on offense starting. So uh, I look for Florida State to continue to improve 
and I do feel like they're on their way back, and it's good to see. Now, we mentioned that game against Miami, and I think Miami has really gotten a lot of people's attention, not just in the state, but around the country as well. Of course, we mentioned that, that opening win, opening season win against uh, Florida State. Uh, then they came back uh, last week and beat uh, Georgia Tech uh, fairly handily. And then um, this week they're playing Virginia Tech. Following game after that is Oklahoma. So a lot of early tests for Miami, and so far they're stepping up and meeting those tests. I like that they've got a tough schedule. I like that they've got a tough schedule up front. And I like their sophomore quarterback, Corey Harris. Uh, there's already a groundswell talking about Heisman consideration for him. Very poised, very polished. Completed 20 of 25 passes this past Saturday, 80% completion rate. I think we see good things happening with him and good things for the future as well. Thanks, Peter. I look forward to this Saturday's games. Mike, let's talk a little bit more about this Friday's games. Another one that really interests me is the Rockledge Satellite game. You've seen Satellite. Rockledge uh, winless right now. Satellite 2-1, and one, kind of going the other direction. Both teams have a cause this weekend. Rockledge needs that win, and Satellite needs to prove they can beat somebody that's pretty good. You'll be at that, or uh, actually that'll be our live streaming game, so people that want to watch that can watch it on the Internet. What should they look for there? Well, I think they're going to be surprised if they haven't seen Satellite now that, that this is a team after so many anemic offensive seasons that can actually move the ball. Um, they've got a, a big, strong junior quarterback in Josh Masanova, who is a, it was a double threat. He's a pretty good thrower, but he's a, but he's a really tough runner. And, uh, and it will be interesting to see if Satellite, against a historically tough defensive team, can sustain the kind of uh, ball movement they've had in their first three games, and that includes their loss to Galley. They still scored 31 points, and they've scored 107 points in, in three games. Um, I think that's something to look for, and of course to see if Rockledge can, you know, they've, they've, they're they 0-2 this year, but they've lost to Bayside and they've lost to Merritt Island, which are two very good teams. It'd be interesting to see if, if Rockledge can actually get a win over a team that uh, historically and probably still um, you would think they would, would still be able to handle considering they've beaten them by an average of like 42 points the last four times they played them. So I think it's a, it's a game that Rockledge needs to reestablish itself and also it's a, it's a game that Satellite wants to show that they, they're not just someone who's going to beat up on, on some of the poor, poor teams. A cause game for Satellite, prove they can do it. Disney Magic out there has been packing the stands. If you, again, if you can't get into that game, go to floridatoday.com for the live stream. You'll be blogging at MCC, MCC playing First Academy. Kind of a similar game, MCC proving it's a playoff team, First Academy, a former power that's kind of off. They've lost some players. Another game uh, in that district, John Carroll, which has been getting votes, MCC's number five, will be at Holy Trinity. So a couple of uh, private school games that are important district games. MCC uh, not necessarily going to be an easy game because First Academy still had that pride. Is that how these things work? Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, MCC probably would be the favorite in this game, not just because they're ranked. It's because I think they've got a veteran team back. You know, they've got a three-year starter a quarterback in Erdman. They've got good backs, about three or four good backs, a uh, good strong line. Uh, I did an interview with Thomas Stone today. That's going to be in our uh, one of our weekend papers, and he's a, a lineman that's headed to Navy. That, this is a very good team that I think needs the test. I'm not sure they get it this week, but they still have John Carroll to play after that, and I think Holy Trinity will be an interesting test too. Um, I, that's what I th think MCC is. I think I think MCC could roll again to another you know high high scoring game. Okay. That's a big game. Mike will be blogging there. Melbourne, Palm Bay, we'll be blogging from there, but that's homecoming if you want to check that out at Melbourne. Don't forget our post-game show will be live about 12.15, probably at the earliest, Friday night slash Saturday morning. Text alerts, you can go to floridatoday.com and sign up for text alerts. You can sit in the stands at any game and get scores from other games. You pick who you want to hear from or you can hear from everybody. Photo galleries online, we send photographers all over the county. We also send videographers all over the county, so we have video highlights that start going up in the wee hours of the morning, photo galleries as well. Well, that's it for this week. We're going to show you the games as we go to the uh, end of the show here, but don't forget to join us at floridatoday.com online and at Florida Today, and we'll see you next week here on Today in Brevard Sports.